hospitality is everywhere. And everywhere there's hospitality, there's Agilisys. 100% focused on delivering high return hospitality by striking the right balance between emotional connection and transactional efficiency. Whether a business requires best of breed performance to modernize experiences or end to end ecosystems to harmonize operations, Agilisys delivers through solutions that are modular in operation yet unified in design. Whether deployed best of breed or in an end to end ecosystem, everything comes together in the Agilisys Hospitality Experience Cloud. Go beyond return on investment to return on experience, elevating financial returns along with the repeated actual return of happy staff, guests and customers over time, creating high return hospitality. A unified solution design is the key. The Agilisys Hospitality Experience Cloud enables three ecosystems, food and beverage, hospitality and leisure, and inventory and procurement to operate independently and collaboratively. Hospitality Solution Studios combine core systems with experience enhancers in curated solutions based on company type. The result? Agilisys users delight their guests, retain staff and grow margins, whether in specific revenue centers or across operations. Agilisys. Make high return hospitality happen. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Rohit Kori. I'm the Vice President of Product and Corporate Strategy here at Agilisys. Today, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to the International Luxury Hotel Association's webinar on maximizing food and beverage revenue, strategies and best practices. I'm the moderator of this session and joining me today is a distinguished panel of David Israel, who is the Senior Vice President at Hotel Venue, Mario Arkelian, who is the General Manager at Cano Place in New York, and Asman Quadros, who is the General Manager at the Watermark Hotel. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank if you. you could just take a brief minute and give your background and where you and the perspectives that you bring to the table. Mario, do you want to kick it off? Sure, I would love to. Thank you, Rohit, uh, for having us uh, at this very distinguished um, uh, session here. It's a pleasure to be among you. Um, my hospitality background. Um, uh, now dates back to about 25 years. Uh, I started my career with Four Seasons Hotels uh, in uh, Beverly Hills. Um, I spent a total of about 11 years uh, with three different Four Seasons properties uh, in the United States and Europe. Um, I was uh, lucky to um, be the opening front office manager at the Four Seasons Park Lane, which uh, helped uh, grow a lot of the industry career and knowledge that. Uh, that I have today. Um, I've also spent uh, about seven years uh, managing an upscale restaurant in uh, Manhattan. Uh, and in 2019, I moved uh, with my family to the Hamptons, where we have been living since. Um, my position here at Canoe Place Inn and Cottages is um, the general manager. I've opened the hotel um, together with um, Mitchell and Greg Reckler, the developers of the project. Uh, we're located in Hampton Bays, which is a hamlet uh, on the eastern part of Long Island, commonly known as uh, the Hamptons. Uh, very popular and very busy destination over the summertime. Um, and uh, I look forward to sharing my insight uh, here with the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. David? Hi, I'm, I'm David Israel. I'm Senior Vice President with Hotel Ave. Um, I've been with the firm for a little over 14 years. Um, the firm oversees about $10 billion worth of hotels on an annual basis. And, you know, everything from asset management to advisory to operational efficiency. Um, so I, I play a lot of um, involvement in kind of creating efficiencies and driving revenue in those businesses, um, you know, as well as helping place make and um, secure the right food and beverage partners for our boutique and luxury hotels. Um, so, you know, across the firm, we have wide varieties of, you know, Four Seasons, Mandarin, Ritz-Carlton, Montage. Um, and then I, you know, personally also oversaw 
um, <clears throat> the build out of a lifestyle brand with Moxie um, between New York, Miami, and LA with, you know, north of 40 food and beverage outlets and six different operators. So, you know, very involved and excited to hear everybody's insight today. Thank you, David. Asma? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for ha having me. David, I can tell you, I don't have as many hotels as you. Mine is a little easier. <laughs> Um, I've been uh, I've been in the hotel industry for about 30 years. I worked for all the big brands, Sheraton's, Hilton's, Marriott's, IG. I most recently opened at uh, the Watermark Hotel in Tyson's, Virginia. Tyson's, a point of reference, is about nine miles from Washington, D.C. We have a 300-suite uh, luxury hotel. Um, uh, underneath the hotel, we have a theater for 1,600 people. And very nice uh, Japanese award-winning restaurant in the lobby and a park out in the 11th floor rooftop that is about two acres uh, with live entertainment, mini golf, and food trucks. So a fun place to visit. That's awesome. Thank Thanks. So, I mean, we, we have a very varied experience and Agilis is, for those who are not aware, we provide solutions at enterprise hospitality, food and beverage, and property management. So, uh, we, I think it'll be a good discussion, so I'm looking forward to it. So let's kind of get started with today's discussion. So starting with, with you, Mario, uh, what, how important is food and beverage for your property and how does it impact the overall profitability? You have a very, what I'd say, maybe it's seasonal, like at certain times of the year, you're like overcrowded, other times, maybe not. So how do you look at f and in, in that kind of a destination market? Sure. So uh, F&B, Rohit, is crucial to the success of the property uh, here at Canoe Place for a variety of reasons. Um, in addition to the fact that we have um, Good Ground Tavern, which, uh, which is our um, signature a la carte Mediterranean inspired restaurant, uh, we also have the largest uh, ballroom and banquet event space in the South Fork. It can accommodate about 350 guests for uh, ballroom events, for large scale social gatherings and so forth. Um, there, is, there is no doubt that um, uh, the food and beverage component plays a huge part uh, for us. Um, we only have 25 rooms uh, in total at the property. So we have 20 rooms at the main inn and then five cottages. Uh, the scale of our F&B operations um, far uh, exceed the capacity of our, of our guest room. So um, it's very important for us to also uh, be able to rely on uh, the outside um, uh, guest capture, uh, not just uh, our ability to cater to our to our in-house guests, uh, who we of course give uh, immense attention to making sure that they're that they're happy uh, when they're when they're dining in our outlets. Um, you know, the the, the food and beverage uh, success at, at the inn um, is certainly driven by by guest satisfaction. Um, it's paramount that that the guests are are extremely uh, happy every time they visit, whether it's the large banquet uh, space or. Um, or Good Ground Tavern. Um, we have the ability to also accommodate guests outside. We have an outdoor terrace um, in addition to the indoor spaces. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's imperative that uh, any kind of food and beverage uh, offering that, that lives in a hotel um, is, is one that offers value to its guests uh, by being either fresh, uh, new, um, uh, offering exciting programs with, uh, uh, with, with, with beverage offerings, with, uh, with cocktail programs, um, but at the same time to also keep the menu engaging, vibrant, um, seasonal, we, we rely a lot on, um, on, on obviously being a, a summer destination, uh, but our, um, our, our key to success really also here is the support we get from the local community. Uh, so that outreach then uh, becomes extremely important, uh, Rohit, where um, locals can visit Canoe Place any time of the year, 
uh, and be part of the food and beverage uh, uh, experiences on property. Yeah, that's that's an interesting perspective, Mayo. Osman, you you guys are located right almost in the city center in Tyson's Corner. How does your perspective change, uh, you know, compared to a destination resort? How do you guys look out for and beverage? Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more with Mario. I think that, you know, regardless, um, I mean, I, I will share a little bit about what we do here at the Watermark, but I think through all the years, just in working in hotels and actually, actually um, work my way up through the ranks of food and beverage, I am a firm believer that, uh, that, that food and beverage is really the tiebreaker among hotels and among competition. I, I, ultimately, I think that, you know, what a, a hotel guest uh, would, look, would look for is a clean room, good mattress, good temperature, uh, and what else, right? I mean, more or less the basics that I think that any, uh, nowadays there's so many great limited service properties out there. Any of those uh, uh, can accommodate that or any full service hotels should be able to accommodate that. So at the end of the day, I think that really restaurants gonna gonna be, you know, what's gonna differentiate your property from any other. And, uh, and, and, and you know, and, and whenever I look at restaurants and hotels, I don't necessarily believe that, uh, that uh, you know, Michelin star restaurant will make the difference. I think that just a really true, um, you know, a, a concept. Like I always say, you know, if you make the best barbecue ribs in town, then you are set, right? I mean, as long as you make the best barbecue ribs in town, uh, it's, it's, it's stick to it. Don't change it. But be proud of what you do, but do it perfectly right, and then everything else will come after. For us, we have a Japanese uh, isekaya concept, which is pretty much just a tapas, Japanese tapas. And we have a theater underneath. We have a uh, business uh, travelers during the week. We have leisure in the weekend because we have a really nice mall here in Tyson's along with and all some other concert venues and, and, and wineries. So we really kind of like, uh, you know, have all type of guests, but we, we just kind of like, have this commitment to ourselves that we're not going to change it. You know, we had a, a, a guest or organizations that ask us for a prefix theater menu, right? We're like, no, we are Nisekaya, we are tapas, we're not going to change it. Uh, outside, we have uh, right next to the mini golf, we have, um, you know, in the rooftop, we have uh, food trucks. We many times cater parties of 300, 500 guests, and they ask for, uh, they ask us to do a buffet. They ask us to do a uh, platters. We're like, no, we serve it in a brown bag. We serve it in a paper plate. You know, so I think that is just key to stay really, you know, stick with your concept and just don't take any shortcuts and and do it as best as you can do it. You know, so that's kind of like a little bit of what we live by, regardless who is coming to 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 the hotel, who's coming to this is like a center, who is coming to this uh, destination or to our complex. You know, we just kind of like stick to to what we do. We just opened the patio two weeks ago. You know, in, the, in this area, you know, you only get three months of patio a year. So uh, we, you know, we have a great opening for our patio, and and we said, you know what, we're gonna do exactly the same because uh, fortunately, also that's uh, we have received great uh, response and great feedback from our guests. So there really no need to start exploring and, you know, changing it every other month. That, that's interesting how you guys have stuck to what you consider as your key roots and, and Mario's team is constantly experimenting with new stuff and looks like both, both are successful. So David, from your perspective, when you look holistically with the number of properties you manage, how do you position f and in the overall context of the property? So as, as everyone said, it's a, it's a key driver. It's a differentiator, right? You know, I think one, one thing that, you know, we haven't really talked about is relevancy in the community, relevancy from a PR and social media perspective, right? Um, you know, most of our, most of our restaurants, and bars are 80, 85, sometimes even 90% local, right? Or local meaning other hotels in that market and or, you know, actual true locals that live close by or destinations if it's in a city coming from somewhere else. Um, and, you know, most of our hotels benefit from the halo that comes from the food and beverage, right? It's very difficult besides, you know, one-off kind of, holiday driven packages to to really generate PR on the hotel side right you need 
you need the food and beverage to really push that, which helps elevate the hotel. And you know, and that that's how you continue to get in the big publications and 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 you and you stay relevant is is using your food and beverage as kind of a a, a tool. Um, you know, I. I I agree with both Osman and and Mario, and I think there's a there's a purpose for and, and there are venues that need to stay true to who they are and not deviate. Right, that is that is core to many of the restaurants we we touch. But you know, yes, we'll e even as it relates to modifications of menu items. Right, we we if there's an allergy or something similar, right we are prepared and can make those modifications. But at the end of the day, you also now, you need to enable the artists to do their work and be true to who you actually are. Um, you know, with that said, and, and, you know, we have a rooftop in New York specifically that twice a year reinvents itself, right? You know, we, we take on and, and do an activation to continuously stay relevant, right? In the market and, and to be front leaning. Um, you know, I, I you know, I, you know, similarly, we have some hotels with food trucks and, and other sources of business. And, you know, it's it's figuring out ways to use those as sales tools for catering and events. You know, it's figuring out when you have numerous outlets in a property, you know, where is the best experience to deliver breakfast and lunch, right? That That's a constant struggle, right? How do you balance the hours of operations and how do you balance the guest experience while also delivering a profitable endeavor, right? So, you know, we particularly coming out of COVID, we spent a lot of time figuring out how to deliver, for lack of a better word, smoke and mirrors, right? Having more venues open, but less kitchens open, right? So you could facilitate and, and, and make the guest happy with various different cuisines without having numerous venues really open. Um, you know, and, and I think the breakfast and lunch piece is something we we spend a lot of time on, right? Because traditionally a guest doesn't want to eat breakfast in the same place they eat dinner. And traditionally, you know, the the groups that can attract talent to staff a high volume restaurant, a bar, are not necessarily the same people that can attract people to work a coffee bar, right? Or to work lunch, right? So, you know, we've had to put forth a completely different hiring strategy to go after and and and, and even pricing strategy of how, how to service the guests breakfast and lunch to make money, right? Because from a guest, Satisfaction perspective, breakfast and lunch, particularly breakfast, plays a big role in in what Osman was saying of clean room, comfortable bed, great shower, right, great temperature, right. Being able to get coffee or or, or some light breakfast is is a big piece of that as well, and that's why some of the limited service hotels are very successful at what they do. Um, and we found ways in the luxury and, and and lifestyle world to figure out how to solve that problem as well without you know, hemorrhaging cash, right? Because that that has been an issue in recent years. Yeah. So you you bring up a good point, David, and it gives me a perfect segue to my next topic I wanted to bring about. So in this world of you use the term smoke and mirrors, which I thought, which I think is a very apt way to describe the world we live in today. Uh, how how can technology help? How can technology help the guest experience as well as as you rightly pointed out, the kind of people we hire to service some of these offerings needs to change. So how do you see technology playing a role both for the guest and the employee? I mean, I think QR codes have changed the industry, right? I think that's a big piece of it. I think, you know, speaking to that breakfast example I gave, right? We, we've gotten, we've moved a lot more venues to more coffee shop, grab and go, almost the Starbucks model, right? But particularly in the, the higher end hotels, people still want eggs or pancakes or whatever it is. And, you know, through the use of technology, we've actually made it where room service delivers to the lobby, right? Or, or to the coffee shop, right? So, you know, you're, you're to the guests, they think they're getting an a la carte menu, 
but you're really leveraging and it's being inputted as if it's a room service order to a specific table, right? And I think that, you know, I think the, the idea of room service has changed pretty dramatically during the COVID years of, you know, food now being able to be delivered anywhere within a resort. Um, you know, and I think the, um, yeah, I mean, technology from a POS perspective, as you got, as you're well aware, right, you know, has gotten significantly more advanced in, in, the, in the last couple of years in terms of being able to use the data at your fingertips, right? So understand what hours of operation you're really driving business, right? So you can, you can tweak your hours of operation, right? And, and, and your labor and, and everything as it relates to it. So I think technology has made us smarter and a lot of the tools we've always had on the hotel side are very much now moving on to the food and beverage side to make smart decisions. Um, but I think technology is playing a big role in terms of, you know, speeding up service, right? So whether that's the QR codes, whether that's mobile pay, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, we're experimenting with technology in the kitchens as well of, of, of certain robots. It hasn't been as successful as I think we all would like, but, you know, I think that's not that far away as well. Sure. Yeah. So kind of shifting focus, Osman and Mario, there's traditionally been the start process that if you're a luxury property, people are coming there more for the, the service element, more of the, the labor's driven service element. How, how, is, how is technology fitting into that or has that trend changed over the last couple of years? So, how do you kind of balance that service element versus technology from your viewpoints? Mario, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, so, Rohit, in addition to what David said, which, which I completely agree, you know, QR codes seem to be gaining popularity. Uh, no doubt, and, and they provide a lot of conveniences, right? I think both for the operator as well as for the guest. Um, it, 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 there is a valid point in the fact that perhaps a QR code takes away from the personal um, aspect of serving a guest, um, approaching graciously, taking the order, um, even, even an upselling opportunity is perhaps taken away from, from the presence of a QR code. Um, nonetheless, to your question, uh, Rohith, of um, you know, maintaining that level of, of, of high-end service, uh, it really also comes down to the people who are actually providing that service, right? Someone has to take um, uh, the, the, the order to the guest. And um, if, if the warmth is added, during that moment of, of service, during that moment of delivery, um, it still could maintain a very um, welcoming and, and very high level of, of, of service provision, even though perhaps some parts in the steps may be taken away by the fact that we're using, let's say, a QR code in this instance, right? Um, I, I see that, um, in our uh, operation here, we also use technology to help us in the heart of the house operations. So we use a software program to help us with inventory, with cost control, with food and beverage uh, uh, percentages. So it does have a very useful impact on our operations because it saves people time, right? It saves us from going around um, and, and, and you know, uh, uh, dedicating what could be a very lengthy process of taking down inventory on a daily basis or a monthly basis. Uh, so there's definitely some advantages there. Um, I think, you know, more globally speaking, uh, Rohit, technology helps uh, also through social media uh, in, 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 in the PR side of things, uh, right? Let's, let's, let, let's be honest. Um, if we are able to run a successful PR campaign where social uh, media is an outlet to help drive business, then then great, you know, great for the business, great for the customers that will visit it. 
so, so there's definitely upsides, no doubt. Uh, but if we stay, I think, true to uh, as, as managers, as general managers or operators on the notion that despite the fact that we have technology to assist us, that human element should never uh, be taken away from an interaction with a guest. Uh, if anything, uh, we add to it, uh, then, um, then I think that technology can, can help us become even more efficient than, than, than previously and stay the course of, of providing a great level of service. Got it. And, yeah. and got it. Um, that kind of makes sense, Mario. And Osman, given that you probably cater to a very wide segment of, of guests between people coming to the mall versus those going to the concerts, do you guys see technology kind of being different for different segments of your guests? Uh, how do you guys view technology in the food and beverage space? Very much. Um, yeah, I think that right now, if there is any operation that is trying to uh, run away from technology or is fighting technology, it's just like a waste of time, right? Because sooner or later, you have to jump on the wagon, right? Yeah. Because that's just what's happening right now. I think that for guests, something that, um, you know, anytime I think about technology and innovation, I always keep in mind that it's only good when it when it benefits the consumer. Right, I see a lot of operations that they just start with an app, they start with some QR codes, but it's like, is that really working for you or for the guests? Is that really working for the consumer? Or you just thought that you were gonna be cool having some sort of technology in your operation, right? So we have a whole lot of, of um, you know, a technology involved in our operation, but um, but we also kind of like, again, I mean, some something I have to say, a company that I respect a whole lot, obviously, in the hospitality world is the Starbucks, right? I think that they have, you know, that perfect hybrid that if you like, you can order, place your order via the app and it's waiting yeah. for you or you can go to the counter. So they're really kind of being able to balance. And that's a little bit of what we try to do here. I think that uh, right now, the big pluses on technology is when guests, you know, they, I think that the patient of a guest really, if before was, I don't know, I'm not making this up, if before was 10 seconds, now it's five seconds, right? If it was two minutes, now it's a minute, I don't know. But it's like, they want an answer right now. Nobody's willing to wait a minute. So I think that whenever it comes down to changing a reservation from a party of four to a party of three, somebody's trying to cancel a reservation, somebody's trying to just make those things happen immediately, I think that that is just kind of the huge value of technology. Um, in our hotel, you can do mobile check-in, you can order for any additional items for your room. Beyond that. We have our own app. When you come to Watermark, you download the Watermark app and you can just, uh, you know, you can request whatever you need for your room, as well as again, just, you know, play around with different features we have there. Also in the mini golf, whenever you are playing, you know, whenever you go into the 18 courses, you can order a drink and the drink is delivered to you while you are playing. So, so we have all that. And then also I think that, uh, like Mario said, I think the back of the house is benefiting a lot from, from technology. Something that I see our team members are really enjoying, especially on the restaurant and bar scene where, you know, the, the age group of those, those team members is a little bit younger, is the fact that they can swap shifts through an app. The fact that they can request for time off through an app, the fact that they get their schedules through an app, all, you know, that's really kind of like what I really appreciate in front technology, getting away from the bulletin board that I have to call somebody to tell me, you know, what day I'm working next week, you know? Yeah. So, so, so that's kind of like, I think how I'm, I'm looking at technology at this point and I'm truly just embracing it. Good. So to kind of summarize what both all three of you are saying is there's no one size fits all with technology, right? You need to give your guests the choice and, Osman, you mentioned Starbucks, where sometimes I want to talk to the barista and order. Sometimes I want that personal touch that Mario alluded to. And sometimes I just want to be able to order through my app and move on. So, so that kind of what I consider as an omni-channel experience seems to be becoming prevalent everywhere. All right. Yeah. All right. So then kind of moving on, we started with the premise that as a as a luxury hotel, you start with the with a clean room, good bed, all of that, and F and B is what helps you stand apart. How do you then kind of use F and B to drive additional revenue into other things, whether it's meetings, whether it's conventions, 
So do you guys use FNB to maybe drive incremental revenue in other sides of the business? Um, maybe Usman, if you could start off. For sure. Uh, I think that this happens in, in you know, probably many other hotels that you come to the restaurant just to have drinks or just to, or, or for dinner. Uh, you you just discover that we have this meeting space and you discover the hotel because of the restaurant. And then now you bring your firm, you know, back to the hotel to have to hold a conference. Right. So that that could be part one, the, the way to really benefit the, the hotel. Something else that, um, you know, right now uh, we are experiencing is that perhaps that's a post pandemic, uh, you know, reaction that guests and groups, they're trying to get away from that ballroom a, a very standardized type of experience. Right now, they're looking at you know we had a, we had a, in in the, the we had a it was this big corporation that instead of having their conference in the ballroom, they decided to do it at the mini golf outdoor, and they brought professional golfers along with the sponsors to play with their conference attendees. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> I, I I would never take the credit. They came up with it. They came up with the idea, you know, but it was more just kind of like, uh, I guess, uh, that reminder that a conference and a meeting doesn't need to be round tables and classroom in a ballroom. It can be standing. It can be outside. It can be breakouts all over the place. So, so that's a little bit of how we're really right now uh, yeah, mixing you know, I mean, all experiences to to bring uh, more revenues to to the hotel. Got it. That, that's a creative way. And Mario, you guys drive a lot of weddings, I assume. So, is that something that your restaurant there helps with that? It, it certainly does, um, uh, Rohit. The um, uh, the restaurant drives quite a bit of um, of business to the rest of the to the rest of the hotel both um, uh, for guest rooms but also for uh, social events and gatherings um, what has worked for us uh, particularly in, in the short period of time we we've, we've been open and um, this is since august of last year is during the cooler uh, season we uh, have come up with activations and programming that drives guests to the Hamptons in, um, in, in times of the year where you wouldn't usually expect that to happen. Um, we've done that recently with having wine dinners on property, uh, bringing winemakers here to introduce their wines, as a result then craft um, uh, menus over a different set of days. Uh, and that helps attract both local um, uh, clients, but also uh, people who would maybe otherwise not travel from the city or, or the tri-state area. Um, what has also been successful here are uh, retreats. Uh, so organized retreats where uh, um, someone has a strong following uh, for, for wellness, uh, for example, and um has has then been able to bring in a number of of their followers to the hotel uh and and create uh, a buzz and, and and just keep things going uh, during the cooler season uh so we've seen we've seen good uh, response positive uh, success during this time good and david is that a trend you're seeing more nationally across that trend towards going towards more the outdoor space and and trying to get creative around it? Absolutely, right? I think the goal is to activate every inch of kind of your hotel. And, and I actually spoke previously on one on a food and beverage panel for ILHA a couple of years ago about how the cruise ship model is actually going into certain resorts and urban hotels, right? Where we're, we're trying to activate every little inch of somebody's stay and, and, and add from a group, various levels of breakouts and surprises and delights to see people through. But also to Mario's point, if you're bringing people to a restaurant, whether that's social media, influencer, PR, you know, or even finding ways that if you realize that there's a corporate business dinner, right, in the hotel, finding a way to show them the hotel, right, show them some guest rooms, get them a real tour and really create a much more interactive kind of familiarization or site inspection, right? You know, that 
I think we've gotten better over the years in making site inspections much more inclusive of a property. Um, you know, we we spend a lot of time ensuring that our restaurant sales team or our catering sales team in our rooms are are really in unison, right? So that we understand the total value of a customer, right? So I'm always surprised when we realize that XYZ corporate account you know, spend so much money in the restaurant and they do nothing in the hotel and vice versa, right? So, you know, I think there's a lot of push towards that. I think there's a lot of push towards activations of campus, right? You know, the, you know, I I, I called it room service, but it's really food delivery anywhere, right? Osman does it on his mini golf course, right? Where, you know, we, we do it on the beach. We do it to random, um, you know, Adirondack chairs in the backyard, right? It, it, it's really finding ways that at every inch of the hotel, you're able to find sources of activation, right? So if you do outdoor yoga, you know, all of a sudden you put up a juice bar or a coffee bar, right? Or, you know, you, you find ways to to kind of upsell little pieces of the experience, right? Because the ultimate luxury transcends cost, right? So if the guest is happy, then the meeting planners are happy. They tend to buy up for a lot of these little tiny add-ons if they think that there's value to it. Perfect. So, which leads to my next segment there, which is using data, right? David, you mentioned upsell, you mentioned about the true value of the guest. Yeah. So how, how are the good hoteliers? Like, what do you, what would your recommendations be for, for the folks listening on how to use data? Like, there's so much data everywhere. How do you make it actionable? Yeah, I, I think hours of operation is one of the easiest, right? You know, we we, we spend a lot of time, um, and the pandemic taught people a lot about really digging deep on their business, right? Do you really need to be open seven days a week, right? Do you really need to be open three meals a day, right? You may need to deliver... In a, in a luxury product, you may need to deliver some level of food and beverage for all three meal periods, right? Right, but you, you also need to look at the buyer behavior. And, and, and if you look at, you know, a hotel that's full with group one week versus a hotel that's transient, lower rated or business travel during the week and then higher rated on the weekends, you need to figure out how to curate your food and beverage programming to that, I think. You know, the understanding sales by hour, understanding your staffing model, right? Which is all technology, right? And I think the, um, you know, and, and we we kind of really evaluated when when you shift from serving food and beverage to just beverage, right? Because the cost of having your kitchen open is a lot of your costs, right? Um, so I, I think we use data a lot for that. I think, you know, you use the data to understand over time from a staffing perspective and, and how you schedule maybe more efficiently, right? You know, I'm going to use a rooms example, but I think it translates to how you stagger shifts on food and beverage, right? We, we've learned a lot over the years about, you know, not every housekeeper needs to come at 7 a.m., right? Because your checkouts are kind of progress throughout the day and you need to stagger shift them. And, and you know, we we spend a lot of time understanding that with the hours of operations of how do you how do you split shifts and how do you kind of stagger staff accordingly. And you know, I think the data has told us, particularly in dishwashing and things like that, that we can allow the dish pit to pile up a little bit and things like that, you know, based on the data right, of how many covers it really gets there. And I, I think data has been great in, to, to Mario's point, in, in optimizing a lot of the behind the scenes, right? You use technology to, to really understand what inventory is moving, right? And you use technology to say, my POS says this, but my inventory count says this, where's the loss, where's the spoilage, right? You know, it, it also proactively tells you when you, when you need to run specials on the food side, right? Because you you know the 
a lot of our POS and a lot of our inventory systems say, you know, your XYZ is getting towards the end of its useful life. And then you figure out how to push it, whether yeah. that's through events or whether that's through specials. Yeah. So thank you, David. So Mario Osman, from your perspective, as operators, how much do you use data in your daily decision making? And part two to that is how much is that pushed down in your organizations at various levels? We use data extensively here, Rohit, um, as it really relates to food and beverage on the back of house reporting that we touched on earlier. Um, that really for us is the game changer. It, it's, a, it's a huge differentiator that we uh, use it on, on a daily basis and religiously. Um, both on a on a uh, property level, but also on on a on an owner presentation level, right? We share this information uh, further up, uh, but also uh, down to the property uh, level. It's it's something that we discuss with our um, assistant department heads and uh, make it uh, make it make it talking points enough for them to understand how data helps us uh, run a more efficient business. Um, also, when it comes to rooms operations too, we have certain software programs that uh, track um, optimum performance, that track uh, housekeeping performance, right? To David's point, uh, what are the hot times when uh, gets the part around that we build housekeeping schedules and, and granted things shift uh, uh, significantly to where uh, you know that, that, that's not necessarily what drives us but it helps us make better decisions uh, because we rely on intel that is provided uh, as opposed to trying to guess uh, things ourselves. Right. And and Osman? Yes, sir. I mean, uh, I, probably I don't have a whole lot more to add because uh, Mario and David covered it uh, all. But something even interesting, you know, that I mean, I I think that uh, most of us, especially on the operation side, things move really quick with technology the last 10 years. And we've been, of course, just, uh, I think that in operations, you are always too busy just trying to figure everything out and trying to make things happen. So, I mean, I continue to, to see the amazing tools that, that are out there that, you know, that many times I think that people that are in operations, GMs or, you know, regionals need to continue to do more, right? I mean, right now you can get reports to see at what time of the day guests are using most of the Wi-Fi, right? I mean, it's kind of like, okay, <laughs> you know, I mean, even that, but it's like, you know, it just helps it's, it help you solve those problems of why either the internet was, was was slow, or you can say maybe that's kind of like when also people are ordering, guests are ordering room service, right? That's yeah. seven o'clock, eight o'clock time. So, so, so again, I mean, I think that data is there, but it's always, it's going to be as, as good as, as you, as you, as you use it. Right. And then, and I, I think that sometimes also a lot of a data overload. Right now, yeah. not everything is always useful. So I think at the end of the day, you really have to just kind of like um, uh, sort every, uh, sort all the different things. And, and also, I mean, you're talking also about manpower. All the all the data is there, but we don't have sometimes all the manpower analyzing everything that is happening. So at the end, I think that it's a combination of, of truly just educating your your, uh, your your leaders to make sure that, hey, they have access to it. Right, many times there's data, but they don't have access to it. Yeah. Make sure they have the access, make sure they understand it, and then making sure that actually, you know, I mean, they, they it will be useful for them. You know, so that's a little bit of a, a thing of what I do is just sorting things out and trying to just cut it in pieces to see really what's useful uh, for, 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 what, for what department, for, for what leadership. Yeah, and I think, I think it's important, you know, and Rohi, I think it's very important for the operators to put pressure on groups like you guys, right, to be honest, right? Like, they, you know, I think it's very important that the operators are clear to their account managers of like, this is where my pain point is, and I need the help solving that, right? Or, you know, I need to figure out, Osmond, to your point, like, I, I want to give the data to my 
shift leaders or my, right, that, that that's pertinent to that, right? So pushing back on Agilisys or whoever it is to say, this is the pain point. I want these dashboards. What dashboards have you provided in a similar situation? And nine times out of 10, there's something off the shelf that they're very comfortable giving. Yeah. yeah I think that the two things there, David, one is, like you said, providing relevant information at the right context at the right time and making sure like it's actionable. Right. There's no point to Osman's point of just dumping a bunch of data on somebody's desk if, if then expecting them to run with it. But it sounds like we, uh, David, you started with it saying we probably are moving towards the money ball trend in FNP, right? Where every little piece of data, every little square foot of property needs to be analyzed to make sure we are maximizing the potential. Yep. And 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 the restaurant business is a penny business. Right. Yep. You know, I, I'm very close with someone who ran a multi unit, many, many multi unit operation who used to tell me that if he could save a penny yeah. per guest in the salad bar, it would save him like a million dollars a month or something. Right. All and and it, it all it all adds up. Right. And I think the margins, unlike the room side, are so tight that you need the data to make really smart, quick decisions that ultimately don't affect the guests, right? We've gotten really good on the hotel side of, of operating leanly, leveraging technology so that we can focus on the service side, right? And I think the food and beverage industry is catching up quickly, but you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more small details on the food and beverage side that there's a lot more loss. There's a lot more spoilage, right? Than you have on the hotel side. So you just have to be really down focused. And to to everyone's point, you need to have your eye on the prize, right? Because if there's too much data, then nothing gets decided. Yeah, and, and uh, speaking as an op, as a provider of technology, I think that's our biggest focus has been is how do we help and make all these data that our systems are generating relevant for the operators of the Mayos and the Osmans of the world can use that at the right context at the right time. So kind of, uh, we are coming towards the close of our, this thing. So I wanted to just kind of wrap this up with asking you guys, where do you see the future going? How do you guys think that hotels can continue to stay relevant and profitable with, with all the geopolitical news and the talk of recession or non-recession, everything that's going around, you all still have businesses to run. So how, where do you see the future headed towards? Osman, do you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, at least I want to feel and hope that we have a bright future. <laughs> but the reason I kind of like laugh about it is because I think that we have, you know, in the hospitality industry, I think that we have a, you know, a great challenge ahead. Uh, we, I almost feel like, you know, they're kind of like um, like a different class, whether when you go to high school, you have kind of like, you know, the, the, the 1998 class, right? Or you go to college, you have the, you know, the 1992 class, you know? So I feel that in hospitality, we kind of like lost the, the, the hospitality class, and now we're starting from scratch, right? So, I mean, anywhere I go to and any property that I, that I ever have contact with at this point, colleagues like you, you know, I continue to hear that most of the talent that we have is new raw talent. You know, so for me, I think that the future is kind of like it's in their hands, right? Which is in our hands, in their hands. So I think that is really kind of like going back to the very basics of what really hospitality is about. You know, coming from from the from the uh, you know post pandemic era. So that's part one, and then uh, part two, I would I would definitely say that sustainability will be a very important trend. I think that we went through all the, you know, healthy trends and all every single diet that people invented. But right now, I mean, something that I experience is that you even have team members that are, that is important for them to work for an organization that is, uh, you know, that, 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 that have, uh, that share the same philosophy in terms of sustainability. We have a lot of um, uh, corporations and clients that, that, that they invest in millions of dollars in sustainability. So they want to make sure that when they do business, when they partner with someone, that we share the same values. 
So I will I will pick those two as as the future, you know, some sustainability and also just uh, going back to the grassroots of of a uh, genuine and true hospitality. I said you couldn't be true, Mario. I completely agree with Osman on his two highlights, uh, Rohit. I would also add um, focusing on on uh, local offerings um, as something that, um, that that guests will look forward to visiting a property, what kind of experiences surround the property that they're at. Uh, so personalizing uh, those experiences based on the market, the geography, um, because there is, there is clearly the trend of um, of experiences, uh, and, and we feel that here quite a bit, uh, where it's not just let's go stay in a hotel, go to the pool, go to the beach, and let's go then back home. Uh, it's more of what can we learn about the area that we're in? What does it offer except for uh, the known um, uh, the known elements? Uh, so experiences, I, I, I feel, are very, very uh, important. Um, and I, I can't stress enough um, uh, the, 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 the real genuine true level of hospitality that I think should, should and, and hope that will never go away um, uh, on, on being able to connect with people, on um, uh, being able to successfully create places of gathering. Um, where, where it still feels very personal and, and very um, uh, and very intimate, uh, right? That that that, uh, that we continue providing that that level of, of hospitality and service in our establishments. Yeah, and, and David, anything you want to add to it? No, I think I think Mario and and Osman hit it on the head. And, and to kind of expand on Mario's point, I think the service piece is key, right? I think delivering genuine hospitality is key, delivering experiences is key, right? And I think as we've learned with so many things over the last couple of years, right? There, there, there's a divergence of, there are things that do need to be robotic, right? You know, there, there's there's certain things that that level of hospitality, you know, um, and what the guest expectation is, is what they want when they ordered it quickly, right? And 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 in those situations, you need to be great at that, right? Then there's other situations where people want truly genuine, they want to be travelers and, and they want to, you know, take in experiences and they want to be upsold. And, and, and that's what we need to deliver, right? You know, we, we technology in some ways has made us robotic, right? And, and, and to Osman's point of retraining the next level, right? Like genuine hospitality needs to come back. Right. And, and that's how you drive luxury. That's how you drive average check. That's how you drive room rate. Right. That's that's the genuine difference between a three star hotel and a five star. It's not what the hotel looks like today. It's the level of service that's provided. And that doesn't necessarily mean more people. Right. It just means, you know, more access. Right. More attention. And, and I think that's that's where the future is going. Right. And I think giving somebody the opportunity to splurge. Right. You know, I, I think one thing that has really been learned across our, our restaurants is that. Whether we ever believed it or not, this high roller menu seems to move. Right. Like it, it may not be moving as much as it did a year and a half ago or a year ago, but. You need to give the the the, the, the guests the ability to feel like they're ultra special. Right. Yeah. And I think that's something, you know, that, that we, we've seen as a continued trend. So to kind of bring it all together, what you guys are saying is the future is definitely exciting. We live in an age of immediacy, like everything needs to be available when the guest wants it to be, wants that to be available. Warmth is still the true bedrock of hospitality, right? Uh, that's, that's what drives all of us. And being aware of, of the environment, being sustainable, being conscious of, of the local community we live in and incorporating that into the experience for our guests. 
uh, whether from a stay perspective or from a food and beverage perspective is definitely the trend of the future. So again, um, thank you, gentlemen, Mario, Usman, David, thank you so much for your time. Everybody, thank you for spending time with us. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, to close on behalf of Agilisus and the International Luxury Hotel Association, I'd like, you, I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar series. If you found this webinar to be of value, please do share the recording. Recordings of past webinars can be found on the ILHA's website under events. Thank you once again and have a good day.